Hello there, and welcome to Cybersecurity Today. I'm Jim Wiggins, the host of this show. In case this is the first time that you've seen our show, let me provide you with a quick overview. We've developed this show to deal with the topic of cybersecurity. I'm a 20 plus year practitioner in the cybersecurity industry, and here we deal with the subject of computer security in an exciting and thought provoking manner. This show is a 30 minute program that uses a talk show newscast format to discuss themes, topics, and current events in the cybersecurity space. If you want to learn more about cyber, you've come to the right place. For those viewers who are currently in the industry, this show will provide thought leadership from cyber experts on the direction of where things are headed. So we really focus on trying to serve a number of different stakeholder groups, from the novice all the way to the expert and everywhere in between. We hope that you enjoy today's program. Now, before we get started, let me provide you with an overview of today's show. We typically break the show into two segments. We'll have our first segment called Cyber Bites. This segment covers current events that are happening today in the cyber industry. Then, in our second segment, we have Ms. Erin Miller, the Executive Director of the Space ISAC, coming onto the show to discuss the topic, the intersection of cybersecurity and space technology. Erin is at the helm of the Space ISAC. Now, ISAC stands for the Information Sharing and Analysis Center. If you've ever wondered what role that cybersecurity plays as it relates to space, we're going to be discussing it with someone who is well versed in this topic. We're going to talk to Aaron about the space ISAC, cyber threats in space, standards and regulations, future challenges, and so much more. I've often looked up into the heavens and wondered if the satellites and space vehicles like the International Space Station orbiting our planet have the same kinds of cyber issues that our systems have down here on Earth. So we're very excited to have Aaron as a guest on Cybersecurity Today to explore these fascinating topics. Okay, let's get into the cyber bites and talk about what's going on in the cybersecurity industry. In a bid to bolster cloud security across the government, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, is on the verge of finalizing security baselines for commonly used Microsoft applications in the cloud. This decision gains momentum following a major hack into a Biden administration cabinet member's Microsoft Cloud account email, prompting a comprehensive government review of cloud security standards. Under the Secure Cloud Business Applications, or SCUBA initiative, started in 2021, CISA seeks to equip agencies with resources to secure cloud platforms. Last year, the agency presented a preliminary security baseline for Microsoft 365 and gathered feedback from the tech community. According to Grant Dasher from CISA, the finalized SCUBA guidelines are imminent, which will be followed by configurations for Google's cloud services. The Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA, has sounded the alarm over a critical flaw in Citrix ShareFile, a widely used cloud storage solution. This vulnerability, labeled CVE-2023-24489, has been actively exploited in the wild with cyber attackers potentially gaining unauthenticated access to customer-managed storage zones. This could lead to attackers remotely compromising user data. This flaw, with a severe rating of 9.8 out of 10, was initially identified by cybersecurity firm AssetNote, who found it stemmed from errors in ShareFile's AES encryption implementation. That's what's making the news today. We're gonna to take a quick break and we'll be back with our guest, Ms. Aaron Miller, to discuss the intersection of cybersecurity and space technology. We'll see you back here in just a few minutes. Here's something we bet you didn't know. Nearly half of all cancers can be prevented, mostly by making changes in your diet, controlling your weight, and of course, by not smoking. Visit prevent50.org and get a free 30-day planner filled with tips, recipes, and more. 
Welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. For our second segment, we're being joined by the Executive Director from the Space ISAC. ISAC stands for the Information Sharing and Analysis Center. The Space ISAC is a nonprofit organization that facilitates collaboration across the global space industry to enhance our ability to prepare for and respond to vulnerabilities, incidents, and other types of threats. It's the only all threats security information source for the public and private space sector. Space ICE Act is led by Ms. Erin Miller, who has over a decade of experience building meaningful tech collaborations and has formed hundreds of formal partnerships between government, industry, and academia to solve problems for warfighters and also national security. Erin is passionate about protecting our space assets and ensuring that the space sector is resilient to threats. Erin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jim. So glad to be here. Absolutely. We're so excited to have you here. I thought maybe what we could do is have you talk briefly about the mission and objective of the Space ISAC for our viewers. Absolutely. So the mission of the Space ISAC is to bring together the global space industry and to share vulnerabilities, incidents, and threats. And we're doing that in a watch center environment. So. Um, our mission is incredibly relevant today as we have so many new commercial missions going up into space, new launches of satellites, and so much potential with up to a trillion dollars for our global space industry by 2040, uh, bringing together the information sharing for cybersecurity attacks on space systems is what we do. That's very interesting. Thanks for that, that intro. Can, can you talk a little bit about the motivation for why the Space ISAC was started to begin with? What, like, what's the history there? Yeah. Um, so it goes back to around 2018 timeframe. We had, you know, the White House and the uh, S&T Partnership Forum actually having a lot of discussions about how we had a burgeoning commercial space sector, and that burgeoning commercial space sector was um, starting to create new infrastructure. And with all that new infrastructure, and historically most of it being government owned and funded, then we needed to start breaking down the silos of information sharing between public and private sector. And after a few conversations and a study that was done by MITRE, then they made the official recommendation that we stand up a Space Information Sharing and Analysis Center, Space ISAC, and treat space systems as critical infrastructure uh, like the other sectors, like the other 16 that DHS manages today. Understood, understood. C can we now talk a little bit about the um, cyber threat landscape and maybe how it differs from other traditional sectors most of our viewers are going to be very well versed about financial sector considerations around cyber, maybe healthcare sector. How does the how does the the space environment differ in, in terms of that? Can you speak to that for a minute? Yeah. Uh, so in Space ISAC, we have something called an information sharing working group. It has about fifty members right now, and it's been very popular. It's really driving the scope of information sharing in the Space ISAC. So it's the most influential group that we have, and they define the threat landscape to include ground, link, space, and that's the typical definition. But then they also added the launch community and the user segment. And when you think of all of that, and then you think of all the other things that are connected to that, you realize it's quite a large attack surface. And so we even consider factors like space weather as a threat to space systems. Not that that's really part of the attack surface, but it's definitely a consideration when you're looking at all threats, all hazards to space systems, and then the connection to undersea cables uh, that ground stations have make this a very vast conversation. So kind of building on that, if I read the current news, I hear a lot about attacks that have occurred terrestrially here mm -hmm. on the ground, mm -hmm. uh, but you, we don't really read much about attacks happening up in space. Can you mm -hmm. speak to a moment of any maybe high profile or notable uh, attacks that have occurred uh, across space in the corresponding infrastructure that's up there? Oh, sure. I mean, there's some that have hit the headline news. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was an ASAT test that was conducted by, uh, it was actually clearly conducted by the Russians. It was very publicly available information and on the news. Um, and they uh, launched uh, a rocket that destroyed a satellite. And so it created a lot of space debris. That's definitely an attack on a space vehicle, <laughs> no doubt about it. Uh, there's less 
overt attacks, we'll say, that are more like cyber attacks that you'd see on the ground only happening on a uh, space asset that's in orbit. And um, those are a little bit um, harder for uh, you know, the news to pick them up because you know, sometimes the owner operator doesn't even know that they're under attack. And that's part of the reason why we have a watch center in the space ISAC is so we can pull in commercial data feeds that are, you know, it's unclassified information. It's available, collected from the private sector. Um, they're willing to share it with us because they're members of space ISAC and it's done in a confidential controlled manner. But then we can share that information with owner operators when we see that there's an attack on one of their space vehicles. Now, just want to make sure your viewers know that this technology needs to mature a lot. I mean, the space vehicles that we have up there, many of them are not um, equipped like we would consider our network defenses on the ground to be equipped to actually monitor attacks. So we have a lot of work to do in this area. So kind of building on top of that terrestrially here, or at least on, on on planet Earth, we have a lot of nation states that tend to kind of, from a cyber perspective, play with each other's assets. Is it safe mm -hmm. to say that in space, that kind of stuff happens as well too? Oh, I'd be lying to you if I said it's not happening. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, think of space systems or satellites as just an extension of our terrestrial network. So they're like nodes on the network. I mean, anything, any type of attack you can do on a terrestrial-based network, you can do on a space-based network. Does the fact that we're in space, does that influence in your estimation um, how cybersecurity has to be thought about? You know what I'm saying? You're, mm -hmm. We obviously don't have mm -hmm. hands on hands on um, on asset in, in, like we do here uh, terrestrially. Right. How, how does that influence the strategy when it comes to protecting those kinds of assets? Yeah, it definitely makes it more of a longer term game, uh, I would say. We, need, we have to plan much further in advance and we have to design cybersecurity in um, at the very first stage of conception of even the idea of building a space system, then cybersecurity is critical to be designed into that. But we also have to think about future technologies that can be utilized and start testing those on space systems. And there are organizations out there who are doing that, companies who are leading the way, who are anticipating uh, quantum and post-quantum implications for space systems, as well as artificial intelligence, and distinctly machine learning is already being included within space systems. But there's a, a, a lot of, I would say, organizing that needs to be done as well to monitor for these attacks. Space ISAC was really just the first step. Uh, but other things like the Aerospace Corporation SPARTA framework is a very important uh, milestone that was achieved in October last year because they, they developed a lexicon and a nomenclature for us to have discussions. I'm sure you're very familiar with MITER attack. MITER attack doesn't cover the space layer. So we have to have the aerospace Sparta in order to have a conversation even about attacks on the space layer. Understood, understood. Let's, let's talk now a little bit about um, space assets. I'm curious, mm -hmm. uh, how do uh, cyber threats uh, to space assets pose risks to critical infrastructure here on Earth. Specifically, think about communications, mm -hmm. navigation, and monitoring. Can, can you speak to that for a moment? Yeah, uh, well, no, most people know about GPS and are very intimately familiar with how GPS works because they're calling Ubers, you know, like I did today. GPS put me in completely the wrong location and I had to correct it. So we experience uh, interference uh, like that as a user. But I think most people are not thinking about the other critical infrastructure sectors besides uh, the, uh, the positioning focus of uh, GPS. Uh, the, the timing aspect is incredibly important, but then um, the other sectors that are using uh, space systems, like uh, there's companies out there who are doing earth imaging and those earth imaging capabilities are being used for um, uh, food supply chain, but also climate change. And uh, all of our John Deere tractors are actually connected in some way, shape or form to satellites. So um, I mean that, I mean, you just think of those three examples that I gave, those are big impacts on our daily life. Then we also have financial transactions that are connected, the energy grid is connected. And I mentioned space weather earlier, space weather directly impacts our energy grid as well. 
and it can really significantly impact transactions that take place that are using satellites because any satellite affected by space weather that's impacted negatively, it might affect our critical infrastructure on the ground. So it almost sounds like uh, the space assets, space assets are kind of almost becoming an extension of what we normally think of as network resources or network access. We, we're becoming so dependent on them, right? Oh yeah, no doubt about it. That's absolutely the case. <laughs> Can we talk to you a few minutes about the standards or guidelines that are used? A lot of our viewers are familiar with like NIST guidance for network protection mm -hmm. or ISO standards or COVID or COSO. In the space environment, what kind of standards are, are currently being used, at least from a, from, a, from a data and a, maybe a cyber protection perspective? Can you speak to that for a minute? Yeah, uh, NIST has really leaned into the space conversation. <clears throat> Excuse me. NIST has really leaned into the space conversation. They created an overlay that's specific to looking at how um, space systems should ha implement controls. And uh, they are, um, I, I would say, continuing to look even further into that. Um, another organization that's looking at that would be the Office of the National Cyber Director's Office. They're exploring Space Policy Directive 5, which was created by the last administration and determining how we're gonna move forward with that impl full implementation of SPD-5. Uh, and then we have SPD-3, which looks at safety. So Space Policy Directive 3 uh, is what we would consider kind of the directive towards uh, the Office of Space Commerce and their space traffic. Uh, it used to be called space traffic management. So you can think of like air traffic management. So that safety consideration is really important uh, when it comes to things that are maneuvering in space. But think of also the positive control that we need over those assets. So if we don't have positive control, we don't have cybersecurity uh, designed in and we're not monitoring for anomalies and impacts on that, then safety and security aren't both happening. So they go hand in hand. So then is it safe to say that the Space ISAC, one of its primary roles is to kind of work with these regulatory agencies, entities to ensure that the cybersecurity standards that are being used are going to be effective and can respond to changes in technology? I mean, or is it is it really kind of a one-way conversation? Do you understand my question? Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a two-way conversation. The One of the biggest reasons why companies are joining the Space ISAC is to be part of that conversation because it's happening now. These things are evolving just as we speak. So we didn't have five years ago, a U.S. Space Force. We now have a U.S. Space Force. We've seen other countries adopt a, a similar approach where they recognize the importance of space. They're designating space systems as critical infrastructure. Uh, we now actually have a U.S. Space Command that uh, officially is headquartered out of Colorado Springs. Space ISAC is also headquartered in Colorado Springs, Colorado. So now companies get to have a public-private conversation between all of our government partners. Uh, we work with DHS as well. We work with NASA. Um, we uh, are you know, very closely connected to the Office of Space Commerce and their mission. So as companies engage with us, they're really engaging with the whole community and it's a collective conversation of, about defense of space systems critical infrastructure. So does the space ISAC then focus predominantly on the domestic market or does it also engage international um, but, uh, organizations mm -hmm. and, and entities. Yeah, I guess my list was pretty U.S. centric. It's we're also very international. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we have members from all over the world, and we're working with governments from all over the world as well. Uh, I mean, obviously, we're only working with those who have the best of intentions in mind here. So we've uh, created some partnerships with. Uh, they're called memorandums of understanding that we uh, enter into with. Uh, JAXA, so the Japanese Aerospace Agency. And then we also um, have started having a number of other conversations with other uh, countries, the Europeans, the Australians, uh, Canadians, all very interested in making sure that there's a formal partnership in place with the Space ISAC. So this is a global conversation. Understood, understood. Mm -hmm. Th that does spawn a kind of a follow-on question. Given such a, a broad coalition, if you will, mm -hmm. of, of participants, 
how do you like try to share sensitive information and what kind of challenges do you run into? I assume with so mm -hmm. many different governments out there, you've got to be selective in how you go about sharing it. Are, are there mm -hmm. processes and practices in place that the Space ISAC has to follow in terms of how they share and what they share and, and those types of things? Can you speak to that for a minute? Oh yeah, um, all ISACs that I'm aware of use traffic light protocol. And so our Space ISAC uses that as well. And it's it was developed by the Department of Homeland Security and what they're using that for is to share information publicly uh, or controlled to just a specific group of people, like our members and our partners, for example, or just our members, or just directly. And we consider that a traffic light protocol red alert if we're gonna issue that directly to somebody else. And it's going to end up being really controlled, private communication that might jeopardize someone's reputation if it was released in a broader fashion. Understood, understood, thank you. I wanna now talk a little bit about future challenges and opportunities. It seems all the rage today is generative artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. You brought up um, mm -hmm. uh, talking about uh, some elements around quantum mm -hmm. uh, computing. I'm curious as to how these technologies are going, to, you think might potentially impact cybersecurity strategies for space. Uh, is, mm -hmm. Are you guys looking at leveraging these kind of technologies in any of these activities that we're talking about? Well, one that immediately comes to mind is what we do on a daily basis in our watch center is we develop alerts and we issue them out. And uh, there is technology today been used for a number of years now called cyber threat intel sharing. Uh, it's uh, been widely adopted by the commercial sector. And when we look at that same capability for space, then it's much more nascent. Uh, cyber threat intel sharing is uh, reliant upon automated indicator sharing that's done in an anonymized fashion. And in space, or for the space layer, I should say, so anything that would be like link or space vehicle, um, or even that space weather data I was talking about, mm -hmm. there's a, not a real standardized approach to cyber threat intel sharing. And um, we quickly, you know, using the word intelligence, start even sounding like we're up to no good, like we're collecting intelligence on people or something like that. And that's not what it's about. It's really about protecting that critical infrastructure. And um, we, we use the word CTI because that's what we share to protect terrestrial critical infrastructure is cyber threat intelligence. So we need technologies like artificial intelligence and machine learning and other um, advanced technologies that can make it so we can bring in that information and we can inform decision making and take action as quickly as possible for the variety of space uh, assets that are out there. Understood, thank you. I'm curious now, um, looking into your crystal ball and kind of looking into the future, what do you think the most um, significant challenges and opportunities lie where cyber and space intersect. Any thoughts on that? Jim, that is a great question. And you know what? Because of the timeliness of uh, what's going on in the world right now and how you know we have had things like the Russian invasion of Ukraine and we know that our space critical infrastructure is extremely vulnerable, then really that intersection of space and cyber is uh, making it so that we have to have an organized mechanism to do coordinated incident response. And so my answer, I don't know if people are gonna like it or not, but we have to designate space systems as a critical infrastructure in the US. It is absurd really that uh, we're not creating that mechanism to have coordinated incident response between our public and private sector in a way that allows us to move rapidly and act to protect our systems against the adversary. Great answer, thank you. So I'm curious, how well informed is the general public about the, the, the threats to, the cyber threats, if you will, to, to space assets? Well, that, I mean, that might be part of the challenge really is that uh, space systems are far away. I mean, we don't really think when, I mean, even though I implied earlier that when people use their device and they know that, um, Uber didn't put them in the right place when they called the vehicle and they wonder why they manually have to type in the address, they might not actually realize that that's because there's been GPS interference. Like those buildings, they're pretty big, they're interfering with that signal. 
well, buildings aren't the only thing that can interfere with a signal. And if that was a terrestrial layer network, then we would be considering that potentially nefarious activity if there's interference with a signal. And spoofing, jamming, and hacking um, of space systems happens all the time. So because of this, then we really just need to make it a higher priority, I think, to communicate to the public that they are, they're dependent upon these systems and they're using them in uh, so many different ways in their life. I guess on average, people use space systems 10 to 15 times a day and they wow. don't even realize it. Wow, mm -hmm. that, is, that is impressive. Uh, so with, that, with all that being said, um, if, if somebody was interested in, in trying to build a career in this, are there programs, are there initiatives, aims at trying to get the younger generation interested, mm -hmm. maybe both in cyber and space, or speak to that for a moment if you could. Uh, well, in my organization, uh, Space ISAC developed a fellows program really for this purpose because we saw that uh, the next generation of talent needs to learn as early as we could teach them, cybersecurity, space, and intelligence. And when you bring those three things together, then a lot of uh, organizations would kind of view someone as a unicorn if they actually know all three of those things. And we decided, well, we do all three of those things, so let's have a talent program where university students, any university that joins the Space ISAC can submit their students to be part of this program as well as our member companies, they can assign uh, employees, maybe someone who's kind of transitioning jobs or needs a career growth opportunity, they can come sit on the watch floor and they can go through our training and curriculum to learn cybersecurity space and intelligence. Understood, thank you. Last question for you is, how can viewers learn more about the Space ISAC? Do you have a website, email address? How would they contact or, or even maybe how could organizations get involved if they wanted to participate? Yeah, uh, well, we're a corporate membership-based organization, so companies that are doing business in space or want to be doing business in space can apply to be a member on our website. There's a form at www.s-isac.org uh, to apply to become a member. Awesome, thank you. Well, Aaron, we are out of time. Thanks for coming in oh, thank and you. sharing yeah. all this really great information about uh, cybersecurity in space. I think mm -hmm. our viewers are really gonna enjoy the, the conversation. Uh, so guys and gals, that's gonna do it for today's episode. We again want to thank our guest, Ms. Erin Miller, for coming in and talking to us about the intersection of cybersecurity and space technology. We hope that you found the information in today's show interesting and that you learned something new about cybersecurity. If you'd like to learn more about cybersecurity today and keep tabs on upcoming episodes, please check out our show's website at https colon forward slash forward slash www.cybersecuritytoday.org. You can also reach out to us with questions or comments at our email, which is contact us at cybersecuritytoday.org. We look forward to seeing you at our next broadcast. Thanks a lot for joining us. Stay safe and stay informed. <laughs>